uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to be here today and tomorrow uh, in this uh, Klima 2019 event. Um, apologies for my delay because uh, unfortunately the airplane was delayed, but uh, we're already running late, so I better start uh, cracking on. Um, if somebody has a question, I'll be happy to answer later on uh, during the questions and answers section or uh, afterwards outside. So, um, as you may know, we had a, um, <coughs> excuse me, we had uh, what we call the Clean Energy for All Europeans package issued in uh, 2016. This was a series of proposals from the European Commission uh, to then start the negotiating process and, and, uh, and get a few new directives and, uh, and regulations. And the whole objective of this process was to ensure uh, the alignment of the European Union with the Paris objectives on uh, carbon emissions and also to protect or, uh, or to defend Europe's um, situation in terms of the energy market because we import most of our, uh, our energy supplies and uh, we import most of our energy supplies and that's a big burden for us. So um, all in all, we had several different pieces of, uh, of legislation being negotiated and I'm very happy that most of them are now either completed and issued and in force uh, or very, very, very close to it. Um, just a few highlights. Uh, the revised energy performance of buildings directive, it was, it entered into force on 9th of July 2018. It's got a 20 month transition uh, Sorry, not transition, uh, transposition period, uh, which means that by the 10th of March 2020, all member states should have completed this process and uh, reported to us on the, uh, on the completion of this transposition process. So the adaptation of the EU legislation into national legislation, building codes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we also have the revised energy efficiency directive, uh, which, had an in which entered into force on the Christmas uh, 2018. We also have then a whole series of new uh, regulations and also the revised or new eco-design and energy labeling regulations. These affect a whole series of, of products and the uh, work for these type of, uh, of elements. So um, uh, fridges, dishwashers, washing machines, uh, supply, uh, power supplies, motors, industrial fans, etc. They will be discussed in Brussels uh, literally this week and, and next week for most of them. So if you're interested, you can follow it up on the um, on, uh, on DG Energy's website. In terms of, uh, of the EPBD, which is, I think, what most of us are interested here today, just out of curiosity, how many of you have read or uh, learned about the, the revised EPBD? Just by a quick show of hands. Okay, so most people. Uh, good. <laughs> um, so just a few highlights. Uh, the big element perhaps is the stronger long-term renovation strategies aiming to decarbonize the building stock by 2050, so 80 to 95% uh, CO2 reductions. We have the enhanced transparency of national building energy performance calculation methodologies. This is really the topic here today. Uh, then we have uh, a series of provisions on e-mobility, building automation and control systems, and also the, provo the proposal to um, produce a smart finance indicator for buildings. These are just very, very quick highlights of the process. Uh, also, let's not forget that we have a series of provisions already in place from the original, sorry, not original, the recast of the EPBD in 2010, namely minimum energy performance requirements linked to the cost optimal uh, methodology, nearly zero energy buildings, which will become compulsory by the end of 2020 for all buildings. We already have public buildings since the end of 2018. And we also, of course, have the energy performance certificates, which are compulsory whenever you uh, want to sort, sell or rent a building. Now, let's go into the, um, into the, uh, the standards, the new provisions on, uh, on standards. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is uh, 10 days ago, uh, I think it was on the 15th of March, uh, the Commission published a set of recommendations uh, for the renovation of the building stock. This is uh, a group of uh, recommendations, a set of recommendations uh, that the Commission is publishing to support member states in the transposition process. 
so they clarify a, a little bit uh, or they interpret some of the uh, some of the legal points and they also provide uh, best practice um, examples across the EU. Why I'm mentioning this is because this set of recommendations includes a set of recommendations on the interpretation of Annex 1. So if you want to have a look, you can check on DG Energy's website and uh, you can find a set of recommendations there. In the coming two to three weeks, we hope, uh, as soon as possible really, we will publish another set of recommendations related to the modernization of the building stock. So there, there are articles or, or there will be uh, text and recommendations and um, best practice examples on, for example, building automation and control systems, inspections, immobility, etc., etc. You can have a look. Right, so um, the most important thing in terms of, of the standard, which is the topic we are dealing with here uh, today, is the new obligation for member states to describe the national calculation methodology following the national annexes of the overarching standards. The aim of these is to improve the transparency and comparability um, of the standards. However, I must uh, make this very, very clear, it is not an effort to harmonize the calculation methodologies. Member states are not obliged, they are not forced to adopt the national calculation methodology. That is their decision to take. We only ask them that when they communicate to us the national calculation methodologies, they use the national annexes of the standard because then we can compare better one methodology with another and we all speak a very, very similar uh, language. So member states still have full flexibility to adapt the calculation methodologies to local and climate uh, conditions, so economic, uh, related to the supply chain in each, uh, in each country, the architectural style, and also uh, the climate in each area. So very important, we ask them to report to us using this, these uh, standards, but they are not obliged to adopt them. Uh, member states were quite strong on, uh, on this point. So um, why do we need um, these energy performance calculation standards? We need, um, we need this to determine the, the energy performance of a building. And we can do this either on a, using the calculated or the uh, measured uh, energy uh, of the building. We use the typical energy uses for, uh, of a building. Those are the relevant ones. So heating, air conditioning, ventilation, domestic hot water, and lighting for most, uh, for most buildings. Very important, this energy performance has to be expressed with a common numeric indicator of primary energy use in kilowatt hours per square meter per year. That's common across the EU. And this numeric indicator, this kilowatt hours per square meter primary energy is used both for the minimum uh, energy requirements uh, applicable to uh, each uh, type of building in each member state, but also when they show the energy performance of a building in the EPCs. Member states may use additional indicators, and this is actually quite common. So, for example, they may use uh, total energy, uh, energy use, non-renewable and renewable primary energy use, and also uh, quite a few member states tend to use these uh, greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, for example, the UK and, and Ireland both use uh, CO2 emissions as additional indicators, but everybody has to use at least the primary energy use. Um, one thing that's, that has changed, um, which is kind of small in the text, but actually quite important in the, uh, in the application, is that we've deleted a small phrase. Uh, we've deleted a small phrase that said we're relevant in the calculation. What this means in practice is that um, now the calculation methodology of the energy performance must take into account the positive influence of a series of elements. So even if these factors are not very common, the calculation still has to allow uh, forest influence to be considered. Um, this is just because certain types of technologies or certain types of use were not, uh, were not used in the past or could not be reflected in national calculation methodologies. Now they have to, even if they are very small. Um, another thing is uh, there are changes in the consideration of the calculation of primary energy factors. Um, so uh, the calculation of these factors Okay. 
So uh, first of all, the calculation of these primary energy factors, it's the responsibility of the member states. And the values across the EU change very substantial, uh, mainly because it's not just because member states calculate whatever they want, it's basically because the primary energy factor does change a lot according to the type of fuel uh, that you're using in your energy mix, uh, the uh, mix of renewables that you have in your energy mix. So if you have a lot of nuclear power plants, it's going to change. If you have a lot of decentralized uh, power plants, it's going to change quite a bit. Um, the procedures to calculate these are not always, uh, I don't like the word transparent, because it looks like they're trying to hide somebody and something, and it's not the case. It's just that they're not always self-evident, let's say, or they are not always very clear. So um, the objective of the EPBD is we are not trying to interfere with the member states on how they define these primary energy factors. That's not our objective. Our objective is to make this whole process a lot clearer and easier to read, so to improve the transparency. Um, again, the member states uh, have, full, have, full, sorry, have full flexibility on how to define these primary energy factors. Uh, and they can use it uh, at national level, but also at regional or local level, for example. Uh, they can have annual, but also seasonal and even monthly primary energy factors. And uh, even in certain cases where relevant, uh, for example, for district heating systems, they may allow also for a specific primary energy factor. So if you have a district heating that uses a large amount of biomass, for example, that district heating system may be allowed to use a different primary energy factor to represent the fact that they are using biomass instead of um, of gas or uh, coal or something else. Um, yes, uh, one very important point. Um, when calculating the energy performance of a building, uh, the energy needs need to be considered, and that's, um, that's very important, as I mentioned before. Uh, in these calculations, we need to account for space heating, cooling, uh, air conditioning domestic hot water, ventilation, lighting, and other technical building systems. What is very, very important, and this is something that has changed quite a bit in the wording uh, between the recast of the PVD in 2010 and the revision in 2018, is the emphasis we're giving to the fact that um, these energy needs must allow for um, the optimal comfort, indoor quality, and health conditions in tight building. This is something that was a bit of a given in the previous version of the EPVD. So it was not stated very, very obviously, but it was very clear to at least all of us um, in the commission that um, energy efficiency cannot come at the price of comfort or uh, indoor air quality. We don't want stuffy buildings. We don't want uh, cold buildings. We, we want buildings where people feel comfortable and, when, and, when, and where people can work and be productive. Um, sorry. I went a bit too far. So um, very important, this has been highlighted in several sections of the revision of the PVD. Now this link with thermal comfort, indoor air quality, and health conditions has been made even more evident, just in case it wasn't clear before. Um, most of you that work in the, uh, in the private industry or in the industry in general will know that one of the worst nightmares probably is to have a cold building because the owner of the building will complain to you to no end and you may end up in court too. So nobody wants that. Um, right, in terms of the calculation of the energy performance of the building, um, we have a principle in the European Commission or in the clean energy package, which was um, energy efficiency first. Um, this applies to national level, uh, but applied to the calculation of the, uh, of the energy performance of a building, what we want to make sure is, first of all, we want to reduce the energy demand, then we want to increase the efficiency of the system as much as possible, and finally, if we can, we'll stick some renewables in it. And that's the way, that's the way it, uh, it should be done. Um, there, the envelope is very, very important, and uh, how to fit in the, the best cost optimal level of, of envelope uh, over the lifetime of the building is a key aspect to reduce energy demand. Then in order to increase the energy efficiency of the system, it's not just a matter of having the most efficient boiler or the most efficient heat pump. It's also very, very important to have the right controls uh, so these systems operate at, the, at their optimal level throughout the year, not just under design conditions. And uh, 
then when you try to use renewables, um, you should combine the type of renewables that you, that you have available in the area with the type of systems and the type of use that you have in your building. So it's this a bit of a holy trinity of how to, um, how to make the best out of the, uh, out of the building. Most of you already know this, so I think I'm preaching to the choir. Um, there's been a few changes on uh, the treatment on on-site and off-site renewable energies in, uh, in Annex 1. Um, important on-site or off-site <coughs> renewable energies can be considered in the calculation of primary energy factors, but it's done and it has to be done on a non-discriminatory basis. Um, we recognize that renewables, uh, whether on-site or, or off-site, improve the energy performance of the building. That's very, very clear to us, and that's why we want to potentiate the use of um, renewable energies as much as possible. But the member states have a flexibility to choose the regime which corresponds be best to its, partic uh, to its particular situation, especially taking into account the national uh, circumstances. Um, Generally, the way this is done is uh, the energy produced on building is directly subtracted from the energy demand of the building on an almost one-to-one -one, uh, basis. Um, then, um, sorry, I, I landed this morning and I'm still uh, probably lack of sugar. Um, right, sorry. So the calculation of these primary energy factors applied to the building. Uh, has to include both non-renewable energy and renewable energy supplied to the building either on-site or on, on off-site. Um, the distinction between these renewable and non-renewable and how it is, this is presented in the calculations, it's very important to make understand the user the benefits of the, uh, the inclusion of renewable energy. So we want to make this as visible as possible. And finally, and that uh, links to the, uh, what I mentioned at the beginning on a non-discriminatory basis, um, it's the last point. Uh, comparable situations must not be treated differently. Different situations must not be treated uh, in the same way, unless this is adequately justified. It's a very simple concept. How it is applied in, in practice um, can change quite a bit. So um, just a quick highlight of a series of studies uh, that we're doing uh, as part of, the, uh, of our work in DG Energy to support member states and also to support the development of our policy. So we have a feasibility study on standalone ventilation systems and also on renovation passports. As you know, we are developing the smart venice indicator at the moment. One important thing, uh, the smart venice indicator is at the moment, um, it's a study looking to develop the methodology and everything. And at the moment they are, they are going to start testing this methodology. So if anybody has buildings or systems uh, where they would like to test how the Smart Renaissance Indicator is working, uh, you can go onto the website of the smartrenaissanceindicator.eu and check information there about the development of the uh, Smart Renaissance Indicator and also to see how you can join this testing, uh, this testing phase. Quite interesting if you have, if you have um, smart buildings or also if you are developing products uh, on the smart sector. Then we also have uh, other studies on renovation rates and new lease energy buildings uptakes, uh, studies on energy performance certificates, and finance and measures on energy renovations. You will notice that I left the first one out. Um, it's because I wanted to mention it now. Uh, we have a study on, on the support to use these SEN EPB standards, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. You can find uh, more information on the website, which I left there. Um, what's important for me to highlight is the Commission has contracted uh, YAP, amongst others, um, to support member states and uh, stakeholders in the adoption or the use of the uh, SEN standards. So for me, his job is to answer as many questions as possible and to help as many people as possible make use of these standards. So the reason I'm saying this, if if you ask him questions, he has to answer them. That's why he gets paid. Uh, and I want him to answer as many questions as possible. So please uh, make as many questions as you can. Um, he's contractually obliged to answer them, or at least to try to answer them. And, uh, and I hope he gets a lot of them and he has to work overtime. 
And uh, thank you very much. Sorry for the very rushed, um, very rushed talking. And uh, if you have any questions, and as I'm sure you will do, uh, I'll be happy to answer them on the questions and answers or later on. Suppose you don't have direct questions uh, to our Garcia. No, everybody has a smile, uh, so they understood your message. Thank you. Thank you for your clear presentation. Um, then, oh yes, this, there is a question over there. Yes, please. Uh, Hi, I'm Christopher um, from Denmark. Um, I just have a question. Could you just uh, maybe uh, explain a little bit, a bit about the feasibility study 19A about the standalone ventilation systems? You had a slide. Uh, yeah, the, the second feasibility point. Feasibility article 19A on standalone ventilation systems. <coughs> Yeah. So, uh, yes, there is one of the provisions on Article 19A is uh, for the Commission to study the feasibility of uh, an inspection system for standalone ventilation systems. So, um, uh, at the moment, the EPPD has provisions on inspections for uh, heating systems, air conditioning systems, and since the revision of the EPPD, also for those systems where the heating or air conditioning system is combined with the ventilation. For those systems where the ventilation is completely standalone, uh, there is no uh, ventilation system, uh, no inspection of uh, these kind of systems at the moment. Um, so the Commission is only studying at the moment is uh, what should this type of uh, inspection, uh, what, what should it be, uh, what would be the cost, what would be the benefits, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we are carrying out this study to develop all of these and to give us idea about the policy. It involves a series of consultations uh, with stakeholders and workshops and, and meetings. Sorry, I don't have the website here, but I, I can find, uh, I can find uh, the link afterwards and I, I can give it to you. Um, but yeah, this is basically it. It's looking at if we had to develop uh, an inspection um, system, how would, for ventilation, standalone ventilation systems, how would we do this? Thanks.